Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, invites you to be the informed patient with the podcast that features experts from Central New York's only academic medical center. I'm your host, Amber Smith. Dr. Toby Le Guin recently joined the transplant team at Upstate University Hospital, and one of the things he specializes in is pediatric kidney transplants. I'll talk with him about that, and I'll ask him about living donor kidney transplants, which are increasing in number. Welcome to The Informed Patient, Dr. Le Guin. Thanks for the invitation. I'd like to start by asking you about probably one of the more rare kidney transplants, those that are done in children. You specialize in these operations. Can you tell us in general how a kidney transplant differs in a child versus an adult? So for kidney transplant, there are the basic steps for surgery. Number one, we need to make sure that there's blood going into the kidney. Number two, we need to make sure that blood's coming out the kidney and the kidney makes urine. So we need to make sure that the urine's going somewhere. So those basic steps are very similar between adult and uh, pediatric transplant. However, there are more um, special attentions paid toward the pediatric population, given the fact, number one, their size, and number two is the cause of the kidney failure. What that means is that there's a different approach from a surgical standpoint. So there's different diseases that cause kidney failure in children? Correct. So in adults, the majority of the time currently in the U.S., the kidney failure is due to severe high blood pressure, diabetes. I think in our health system, those are modifiable diseases. In um, pediatric population, most of the disease that cause kidney failures are genital or genetic diseases. And it depends on the congenital disease or main disease that pediatric nephrologists sometimes recommend the removal of the native kidneys either at the same time or before doing the transplant. Versus an adult, usually most of the time, don't remove the native kidneys unless there are true indications. And usually the indications for that are infection or severely large cystic kidneys. So with children with a genetic concern, if you remove both of the kidneys, do you try to transplant two kidneys and do they have to come from the same person? So the discussion to decide if they it is ready for transplant is a multidisciplinary discussion with the pediatric nephrologist, with um, surgeons, with a social worker, and everybody else. We decide that if there is an indication to remove the kidneys, the native kidneys, then we'll do that usually at the same time at the transplant. But at the time, people have two kidneys, so we remove both kidneys and we place a new kidney in, usually kids can survive with one kidney. I see. Now, can children receive a donor organ from an adult? For sure, absolutely. Majority of my work in training was that it was usually from a um, related adult. So parents, uh, family who donate to the kids. Are parents or family members always a good match for a child? Like I said, in order to determine a kidney transplant is a go, we meet as a whole group. We decide if the patient, the kid, is a transplantable candidate, number one. And number two, we identify a donor. Usually, we push for a living kidney donor. What that means is that a LP donor donates one his or her kidney to the pediatric patient. We look at the size, number one, we, and we look at the blood type match, and we look at the antibodies mad. If everything works out either from the family, usually um, the parents, usually they have a pretty good match based on the antibodies and uh, blood type, and we'll proceed with that. Fortunately, let's say if one of the parents is not a healthy donor and the other one is not a match, then what we can do is that we can put that parent who is a possible donor and a pediatric patient into a, a pair exchange program where we find an appropriate donor. And then that donor provides for the child. Okay. 
Now, are you looking at this? Will this transplanted kidney be a lifetime organ for that child or how long do they last? So the for living kidney, we usually hold between the average between 10 to 20 years. What I've noticed within a pediatric population is that it can last for 10 to 15 years. The biggest component is the compliance medication. So this is why we want to involve social worker, pediatrician, nephrologist, and everybody to involve because putting a kidney into a patient works fine, but they need to make sure that they follow up with medication, they follow up with labs, taking appropriate anti-rejection medications, because if they don't, that can increase risk of rejection. And non-compliance can be a big barrier for young um, pediatric patients because, you know, it's a lot of learning. And when you go through school and everything else, it's a change. So I think that's a bigger um, barrier to that. Can you compare the outcomes for a kidney transplant from a deceased donor with that of a living donor for a child? Yeah, living donor kidneys always works much better in both adult and pediatric setting. Like I said, usually between 10 to 20 years for the living donors. A deceased donor kidney, what that means is that a patient who um, has irreversible brain damage or who is brain dead, he or she is a um, organ donor and family approves for an organ donation. So then one of the kidneys will be up for donation. Fortunately, with a deceased donor, there's many variability that can affect the, what we call a long it lasts for or shelf life. So compared to a living donor, deceased donor, shelf life is a bit lower. So let's talk a little bit more about who can be a living donor and how do you go about doing that? Yeah, so this is what I talk to every single potential transplant recipient who come to see us for evaluation is that a living donor's kidney works much better and that should be your ticket to get a transplant. Let's back up a little bit in the sense that transplant is basically putting a new kidney into a body that can take over the failing native kidneys. We can do that preemptively. What that means is that before they, they get on dialysis or we do the transplant while they're on dialysis. Preemptive transplant before dialysis has a better survival benefits in general. And then transplant also does better in the long term compared to being on dialysis for the rest of the patient's life. So I do believe transplants work. So where does a kidney come from? The kidney comes from a donor. The donor can be as a deceased donor or a living donor. And we talked earlier, a deceased donor has severe brain damage. They are organ donors. They can donate one of the kidneys. And the big donors is a healthy donor, either friends, families, strangers even, who can donate one of their two kidneys and they can live for the rest of their life with one kidney. The living kidney lasts longer, has better quality, and the surgery itself is more planned because deceased donor, it's unpredictable. It's whenever there is an available organ, you get called in. Besides of that, there is a biggest disadvantage on the deceased donor because there is a wait list. It's making sure that there is a fair for the entire system or everybody's on the wait list. And when you get activated on a wait list, you start at the bottom of the list. You only move up on the top of the wait list based on how long you've been waiting on the wait list. So time and your blood type. So usually in this region, central region of blood type O, we expect patients to wait between four to six years to be on the top of that deceased wait list to be able to see good offers for a deceased donor. So that is a pretty, um, like disadvantage. Are children able to be living donors? So living donors is 18 years old and above. In regards to what is the maximum age, there's a bit of nuances, but usually we have done people in the late 60s, maybe one or two patients who are healthy, 70 years old. So they obviously have to be healthy to be a donor. Are there any other disqualifiers for someone who would like to donate? Yeah, so the main reason is living kidney donation. This is coming from the donor who this surgery is not needed for 
that person. There's no physical benefits. However, there are significant emotional benefits, either being I'm saving a child, I'm saving a life of my spouse, or I am supporting somebody and a stranger. So there is a huge emotional benefits in there. You know, we rely on that. So we want to make sure that patients are physically and mentally, emotionally prepared for the whole process. Usually the disqualifiers that and the absolute contraindications would be if they have any risk factors that can affect the kidney disease. So as I said before, any severe hypertension, any severe uncontrolled diabetes, um, any recent cancer, and also at the same time, significant obesity. So those are the absolute contraindication. Like I said, it has to be severe and uncontrolled diabetes. We do see people who are sort of um, pre-diabetic or maybe just have um, hypertension is not monitored by one blood pressure medication, those patients can still be evaluated. Does a donor have to have health insurance? No. So the donor's process, everything is covered by the recipient surgery. If gotcha. Well, what sorts of medical testing is done once you have someone who's willing to donate what lays ahead for them before you determine whether their kidney can be used? Yeah, so in upstate, this is our process. They fill out a questionnaire. The questionnaire is basically, basically screen out people who are their absolute contraindication. So again, significant obesity, severe hypertension, control diabetes, or recent cancer. After they pass through that questionnaire, well, our living our coordinators will contact them will do a 24-hour urine collection to see the function of the kidneys. There are patients who have overall poor kidney functions, then they cannot proceed because they have poor overall kidney function. They should live with two kidneys versus one, obviously. After we uh, determine that patients have had enough kidney function to undergo the donation, then we see them in clinic at that clinic visit, the potential donor sees a, a surgeon, a nephrologist, finance coordinator, a social work who supports and identify any issues that the donor has. And we also have a living, um, we call it ELDA, which is an independent living donor advocate. So that person also making sure that donor does everything, you know, in sense and not being pressured by anybody. After that clinic visit, they will do basic labs. So we check for their diabetes, check for our cholesterol level, check for blood type, and we do a CT scan. And we meet as a group, the social worker, Elda, the nephrologist, and I meet as a group, and we determine based on the, those data point, the patient is approved to be a donor. So you're really looking out to make sure that this person will be able to remain healthy afterward. Absolutely. And, um, you know, like I said, because this is a strict process, we always strongly suggest potential kidney recipients who are on dialysis or still waiting to be on dialysis, that they spread the words out a lot significantly because potential donors go through a lot of hoops to get to that point. So we eliminate a lot of people. You're listening to Upstate's The Informed Patient Podcast. I'm your host, Amber Smith. I'm talking with Dr. Toby Le Guin from the transplant team at Upstate University Hospital. Well, once you do approve someone and they're matched with someone who needs a kidney, can you walk me through what happens on the day of surgery? Both the donor and the recipient are at the hospital ready for surgery. Do you, as the surgeon, do you operate on both of them one after the other? I would like to also get back a little bit after the process of approving them to be a donor. So the kidney goes into the recipient. That kidney has to be blood type match and has to match the antibodies of the recipient. So let's say if that recipient has a potential donor who unfortunately doesn't have the same blood type or antibodies doesn't match well with the recipient. It's not an automatic rule out that donors can proceed. 
So what we do is that we participate in a national kidney exchange. So it's another way to say that there's a kidney bank run by a national program. What we do is that we take this pair, the donor and the recipient who are not a match, put them into a kidney bank, and we sort through the whole national kidney bank to find an appropriate match, things on size, a antibodies, blood type to that recipient. And that recipient's donor is donating to somebody else who have a similar profile. Does that make sense? So a donor here at Upstate, yep. their kidney may not go to a patient at Upstate. Correct. If, see. if that donor at Upstate doesn't have the matching profile, right? So that's, I think that's important to point out is that I think a lot of people have the myths that I have to find someone who match me. It does not need to be that. It needs to be the kidney has to match to the person, but that kidney can come from anywhere. So the more important um, bottom line is if you can find an approved donor, we will make sure the transplant can happen. So in regards to the donor briefly, how do we decide which kidney to take? If both kidneys are similar in size and function, we usually go for the left kidney, remove the left kidney because has more preferred anatomy for the recipient surgery. Let's say if one kidney is bigger than the other, we will let the donors eat the bigger and better kidney and proceed with removing a whole, whole lesser kidney to the recipient. That's how we determine which one to do remove. The day of surgery is a well orchestrated day in the sense that we make sure that the donors and the recipients are being seen before surgery. We make sure that they have all the lab tests and everything carefully done. The day of surgery, the donor surgeon is usually either me or my partner, Dr. Garner, who proceed with the donor surgery first. And then the recipient surgeon will go in usually 30 minutes to an hour after we start the donor surgery, we remove the donor's kidney and we quickly bring it over to the recipient sur surgeon to proceed with the recipient surgery. So you have two separate operating rooms and two separate operating teams, it sounds like. Correct. Right, absolutely. The reason for do that is that we want to make sure that, number one, that the recipient surgeon, the, the recipient can undergo surgery. Make sure that we have identified appropriate anatomy for to be transplanted. Let's say the recipient can't undergo certain things or if something happens, we should not remove the donor's kidney or the recipient. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So the kidney connects to the bladder by a long, thin muscular tube called the ureter. Yeah. Do you connect the donor kidney to the recipient's ureter or do you also remove the donor ureter? and connect that to the recipient's bladder. I see you, you did your homework. So the basic step, like we discussed earlier, there is an inflow blood going to the kidney, and then it's also blood draining the kidney, and then the kidney has a ureter, which makes urine. We have to hook it up somewhere. So there are three main connections of the kidney transplant. Number one is to establish inflow, which is the, the artery, but blood going in, and then establish the outflow of the blood, which is the vein. So we put two blood vessel connections. And then the third connection is the ureter. Most of the time, we hook it up to the, the donor's kidney. We hook the ureters. We hook it up to the recipient bladder. There are a few instances where, let's say, the bladder has issues or we can reach the bladder, then we hook it up to the recipient's ureter. But most of the time, it's the recipient's bladder. Okay. And how long do the operations take usually? So the donor surgery, the living donor surgery, technically usually takes between two to three hours. Then the recipient surgery between three to four hours. Okay. And getting back to the size of the organ that's transplanted, if you take a smaller kidney and you put it into an adult that's large, does the kidney grow? Does it get bigger? So it does not grow. So there are certain special cases where we used what we called en bloc pediatric kidney. 
So these are unfortunate events where very young babies who suffer severe brain damage and also have brain death, the parents proceed with the organ donation. So the babies donate their organs to be the deceased donors. We take these babies and blob, that means we take both kidneys from the patients and we place them into potentially an adult patient, very small patients. So in those cases, you can see these babies' kidneys grow over time a little bit. However, the majority of the time, when you put a adult small kidney to an adult larger person, that doesn't grow. And I don't think I asked you this before, but does the gender matter? Does a woman have to donate to a woman and a man to a man? Or does that matter? So I think this is where we talk about the nuances and details of selecting the right match. So in a living donation, we can have those discussions. We can make sure that the longevity of the graft can last long. So let's say, for instance, the husband is a male, he's a recipient, um, needing a kidney, and the wife is a donor. Let's say when we do a workup, donors, the wife, has a very small kidney, and husband is a larger male. Yes, technically you could put it in. However, the shelf life of that kidney may not last as long. So what we usually do in that living donor situation is we can put them into a kidney bank again, find an appropriate match to the recipient. Sometimes, most of the time, usually either the spouse, they're pretty well matched based on size, then we can just proceed without doing the kidney bank. But essentially, with a living donation, we spend more time trying to figure out the best match. For deceased donor, fortunately, we don't usually have that ability to do that because as a deceased donor comes, we can make a decision based on if it's a very small kidney from a small donor, we can't put it in a bigger guy because the option doesn't work well. But sometimes we don't have choices because what if that person is on top of the list and they need a transplant? So that's why it's harder to do a deceased donor. Well, let's talk about recovery for the donor and the recipient. How soon can they each return to normal activities? Let me focus on the donor. For donor, I do laparoscopic surgery. So I make small incisions using laparoscopic tool. I do have to make a um, incision about six centimeter in order to extract the kidney out of the body. For the left kidney, there are three incisions. For the right kidney, there are four incisions. Fourth incision is very tiny incision to lift the liver. It's about five of them. So basically, very, they are very similar. But donors, they stay in the hospital between one or two days. The criteria to be discharged from the hospital are if they can walk, if they can eat afterwards, passing gas, eat, and pain well controlled, then we'll let them discharge from the hospital. If they come back to see us, two weeks after surgery, and six weeks after surgery. And we do labs every six months, 12 months, 18 months, and two years. That's the donors. But the recipient, they stay in the hospital between three to four days. Similar criteria to be discharged, pain control, walking, eating, and eating. Usually with a living donor kidney, they pee right away which is what we know that it works right away. With a deceased donor, that doesn't really happen all the time. So we usually monitor that more closely. And stay in the hospital hospital between three to four days. After that, discharge from the hospital, they see the surgeon twice a week for one month, once a week for one month, and once maybe another two weeks for one month. And monitor very closely with weekly labs. So are there any recommendations for lifestyle changes or are there certain activities that they are advised not to do sure, because of the kidneys? For the living donors, we usually recommend no heavy lifting and strenuous exercises for at least four or six weeks to make sure that all the decisions are healed nicely. Otherwise, the biggest component about living donor is maintaining a healthy lifestyle for the rest of their life. What that means is that you live with one kidney. So this is about how long can you live with one kidney? Are there any medical risks? 
we, as a nation, we've done living donor kidney transplant over the past 40 to 50 years. So there are tons of data that show that this is a very safe surgery and in regards to any risk of developing high blood pressure or kidney disease on the remaining kidney, donors actually have a very similar or slightly higher risk than the general population. Very minimal risk. They actually, the donors live longer than the general population. What we encourage and emphasize are um, number one, healthy lifestyle. Number two, making sure that not making weight gains or weight loss. If you are slightly obese, try to lose some weight, essentially trying to save that kidney. So those are usually the recommendations for the donors. Uh, for the recipients with, with a working kidneys, you get off dialysis, you're able to do more things that are more enjoyable. But the most important aspect is that you have to change your lifestyle a little bit in the sense that you're taking anti rejection medications for the rest of your life. And then you need to make sure that you're aware of you are basically immunosuppressed compared to the general population. You have a higher risk of developing infection. So those things that we press on the patient. I think you said that the native kidney is usually left inside. Correct. If it is diseased, will that spread to the new kidney? Yeah, it's a great question. So like I said, if patients have kidney failure due to hypertension and diabetes, which are the highest causes of kidney failure in America, that should be transferred to the new kidney if your high blood pressure and diabetes are well controlled after transplant. If your blood pressure and diabetes are poorly controlled after transplant, that can affect the kidneys for sure. So um, the third kidney disease, such as polycystic kidney disease, or in other words, these kidneys have innumerable cysts and they grow so large that disease should not be transferred to the new kidney. Otherwise, there are some genetic diseases similar to pediatric that adults can have, such as IJ nephropathy or vasculitis. Those diseases can recur with a new graft, usually between 10 to 15 percent. So it's not that absolutely zero recurrence. So that's why patients do get to have a very close follow-up without transplant nephrologists. Let me ask you why people should consider becoming living kidney donors. I think that's a great question in the sense that there are still a lot of people on the wait list and they can stay a long time. And then organs are deceased organs don't come around all the time. And like I said earlier, deceased organs also have very variable shelf life. So the best way for a patient to fully have the best benefits from transplant is through live donors. And there are people who are willing to donate their kidneys out of the goodness of their heart. When I talk about the kidney chain, the, the National Kidney Banks, we have a lot of patients who have a lot of antibodies in the system. So these recipients are very difficult to match or difficult to find in donors. So the more donors you donate and put in a kidney bank, that can essentially set off a new chain and the ability to increase the um, ability to find a donor that match that recipient. But yeah, so that's the why the culture should donate. Well, Dr. Le Guin, thank you so much for making time for this interview. Yeah, thanks for uh, uh, all the questions. My guest has been Dr. Toby LeGuin, a transplant surgeon at Upstate University Hospital. The Informed Patient is a podcast covering health, science, and medicine, brought to you by Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, and produced by Jim Howe. Find our archive of previous episodes at upstate.edu slash informed. If you enjoyed this episode, please tell a friend to listen to and you can rate and review the Informed Patient podcast on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or wherever you tune in. This is your host, Amber Smith, thanking you for listening.